Okay, folks, sorry for the delay. Uh, let's get started. Uh, it's an honor to be able to present this session, uh, Powerful Data Science with Project Jupiter and Drupal at DrupalCon. Um, the talk is going to focus on the specific technologies mentioned there. It's also going to look more broadly at some significant transformations underway in the very concept of what is complete high quality content in an increasingly data centric world. My name is uh, Mike Nescott. I'm director of cloud and DevOps solutions at JBS International. At JBS, we do a lot of work uh, with Drupal and web development. We also do a lot of work in research and statistical analysis. So we have a special interest in the intersection of these different disciplines and specifically in the um, growing field of data science. Um, we are headquartered in the Washington DC area. We have do a lot of work with the US federal government. But uh, we also have offices in the Bay Area, San Francisco, Atlanta, and we have people working throughout the world for JBS. I'm currently based in Seattle right now. The takeaways of this um, presentation, first of all, there are continuous improvements in our ability to collect, process, analyze, and communicate data. We can extend our existing content management systems uh, to benefit from this enriched data, specifically by using tools available with the through the Jupyter Notebook ecosystem and languages that are strong in data science, including Python and R. And finally, we'll see that these, relative, these tools are relatively easy to learn to get up and running um, to engage in data exploration and content development. The term uh, big data has almost become cliche, but several studies have shown that in fact, we are producing more data at an impressively exponential rate. Um, behind this explosion in data is a vast array of expanding data collection and processing networks that um, um, span uh, from the outer edges of the universe down to our own personal bodies. This data, along with these processing capabilities and networks, um, along with the, our improved ability to process data, and having more people that are trained in data science has led to the rise of data science. Um, the term data science actually uh, dates back um, a few decades, but the modern uh, coinage of the word has been attributed to a gentleman named Drew Conway, who developed this um, Venn diagram of data science, which depicts it as the intersection of math and statistics, programming, and substantive expertise in a particular area related to the data under consideration. Within data science, there's been a lot of progress recently, specifically in machine learning, and within machine learning, which is closely related to artificial intelligence, there's been a lot of attention um, focused on a family of data of mach of machine learning algorithms uh, that perform what is known as deep learning, using vast networks la of layers of um, virtual neurons to extract value and make sense of large reams of data. Within the last uh, few years, we've seen impressive advances in speech recognition and image recognition. Um, uh, deep learning is a core part of cutting edge products like Amazon Echo, and it's being used prominently in services like Google Search now. So with the rise of data science and um, the availability of data and our ability to make sense of it, um, we are living in an increasingly data-driven world. Um, data science now has a big role in many fields that previously were considered to be relatively low-tech, such as farming and the humanities. 
Data science and machine learning is an integral part of more and more applications. And data science is playing a more prominent role in content development. Uh, this is a pyramid called the DIKW uh, pyramid that is related to a model that's been around a while that looks at the process of taking data and then extracting information from it and making sense and content from that. Um, historically, the view has been that you have a lot of data maybe, but um, much of it um, is, is wasted. You know, it's noise. Um, the, you end up with a relatively small amount of useful content from that data. In, um, with the rise of data science and the advances in machine learning, we can imagine this, um, sh the shape behind the model being transformed quickly. Um, it's, in, so the um, new situation, the new model perhaps, is that more data is content and more of our content is data. Um, related to um, data science and machine learning and content development, there's been a lot of attention paid recently to applications such as chatbots um, and the use of natural language processing to uh, construct conversational interfaces. There's perhaps been more widespread practical application to this point, however, using natural language generation to create automated news stories and automated reports in areas such as finance and fantasy sports. Uh, the data-driven world, however, is not necessarily a utopia. Um, algorithms are being used in a great many fields now, and there's been several studies that have shown that a lot of these algorithms have uh, biases in them, potentially, that can do personal damage to people in the criminal justice system, people uh, uh, you know, buying homes, people applying for jobs, or having evaluations performed on them in their current positions. Another problem is that, um, that has become evident is that um, data science is becoming increasingly used in medicine and other sciences, uh, but these fields are still heavily reliant on the existing body of knowledge often contained in research journals that date back years. And over the past few years, a number of individuals have taken major studies that are published in these journal articles and have, try, have looked at the documentation on the process that were used. They tried to replicate the results and found out they couldn't do it. They came out with different findings. This has led to uh, what some have called a reproducibility crisis in science. Solutions um, to some of these problems may be available, at least partly, from um, the collection of open movements that have emerged over the, over the past few years, uh, specifically open data and open source software. If the uh, code and the data uh, that are used to create the algorithms are freely available, it becomes much easier to test them, to detect the biases that may be in them, to eliminate those biases. It also becomes easier to collaborate and build upon the algorithms um, that are high quality. It is the quest for a development platform that is capable of working with open data and can be used uh, in the pursuit of reproduce, reproducible research to uh, produce uh, high quality computational content that has led to the rise uh, recently of the um, Jupyter Notebook, um, previously called the IPython, IPython Notebook. It uh, initially only supported Python, since has expanded to uh, support more than 40 languages. Um, so, the, this is basically the anatomy of a notebook. Um, it consists of a web application uh, that provides an interactive interface that, that can be used to weave together text, uh, mathematical formulas, executable code, 
um, interactive widgets, and rich media. Um, the, the basic format of the notebooks is actually JSON, though, which gives the right mix of simplicity and functionality, allowing this uh, platform for rich media to be easily shared in different formats and to be version controlled using Git and to, um, to, uh, to, be, to have uh, GitHub be used as a, 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 actually a content distribution and content presentation platform for notebooks. So I'm gonna actually um, briefly demonstrate a few examples of the Jupyter Notebook uh, that I have um, stitched together by cloning other notebooks from GitHub and then extending and mashing them together. Um, so I am running these notebooks on uh, in Docker containers. Um, it's Docker is a offers a, a great way to get. Um, a Jupyter Notebook up and running to be able, be able to begin exploring what the platform has to offer. There's a wide collection of specific data science notebooks available on GitHub that include not only the basic um, um, Jupyter Notebook application, but also a lot of data science tools in different languages uh, pre-installed. So, first of all, this is a notebook that uses open data that's available from the World Bank. Uh, specifically, they have a data set known as World Development Indicators that show the socioeconomic pros progress of different countries over the years in a number of areas, health, education, and welfare, for example. And, uh, what this notebook does is uh, basically um, show the process of taking um, 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 data from the World Bank data set, um, importing it into the notebook in what is known as a data frame, um, and using Python tools to process the data, to visualize it, and then to output um, the graphics in a dyna dynamic format. So what I'm going to do is basically um, from this uh, command uh, from the toolbar of the Jupyter Notebook, I'm going to run all the cells in this notebook. What's going to happen is that these cells, as you can see, which uh, combine text and data, are going to be used, are going to execute in sequentially from the top of the notebook to the bottom of the notebook. And uh, this, the, in this, at this point, the data is being pulled into this data frame structure in Python. Uh, we can be, begin to explore the different statistics here. And then uh, on the fly, we have these uh, graphs generated. Um, we can then, um, if we want to, uh, take this, uh, you know, modify this notebook, share it on GitHub. We also have capabilities here of uh, downloading it uh, into a P, you know, PDF or HTML format for import into another type of uh, content management or display system. Uh, next, I'm gonna look at a notebook that is involved in an area that is of specific interest of uh, the team we have at JP. S. Okay, and so this this uh, is a uh, we do a lot of work for a government agency called the National Institute of Aging, which is part of the National Institutes of Health. Uh, in the federal government um, in the United States. And specifically, uh, as part of that project, we developed an Alzheimer's disease clinical trials database. 
I found this notebook out there on GitHub that uh, takes Alzheimer's disease um, data, um, related data from a, from a study that looked at the early diagnosis of the disease, and it applied different machine learning algorithms um, to that data. Um, there is a article related uh, to this subject material in the clinical trials database that we, made, we built for the National Institute on Aging. And so what I did was take the notebook, add, uh, pull in some content from that, um, the National Institute on Aging site, which we built on Drupal 8, recently migrated it from Drupal 7. And um, in the Drupal um, um, 8 application, we used um, the new services-friendly um, views support for uh, outputting JSON, created a simple web service, and then um, here is the Python code that consumes the data from Drupal and is used to display it in this notebook. Uh, in addition to displaying the content from Drupal, um, what this notebook does is pull in that data set um, that, that has a group of uh, data from Alzheimer's disease patients, normal controls, and it runs different machine learning algorithms. On that, um, on that data set. I'm going to rerun it here. So there we go, sorry. Uh, had connectivity problems for a minute there, switching out to the internet. But uh, here are the statistics that and a chart that compares the, um, the performance of those different machine learning uh, models. And uh, there's a link here to a notebook that was developed by, a, another notebook that was developed by a researcher at uh, the National Institute on Aging a gentleman named Murat Biljal, and um, he is part of a project that has, is bringing together a consortium of research centers to um, find better ways of detecting what is known as preclinical Alzheimer's disease, uh, finding evidence of the disease in its very earliest stages. And uh, what this notebook displays is the is the process used in, um, that's going to be used by that consortium in uh, extracting uh, neuroimage data from MRIs and CT scans. It's going to display, um, uh, the, the, the different um, methods that are used um, in constructing this data. It's often um, very essential um, in, when, when you're looking at scientific research, in, in being able to look at the process uh, from the very onset when the data is collected, because there is a lot of decisions made early in the process in terms of uh, how to deal with uh, missing data or data that's not clean that have you know potential implications down the line for the actual results. So when we look to being able to uh, arrive at a world where more of the research is reproducible, it's essential, uh, if possible, to be able to distribute this type of computational content along with the journal articles of the future. Just take uh, one final look at a notebook application um, that is also involved in the world of health.
And this is looking at a model that um, was developed uh, to examine the process of, uh, um, of disease spread and um, um, how immunization can aid in halting disease spread. Uh, specifically, this is a model that um, uh, will consider such things as, you know, what, if a disease is spreading in a population, what percentage of that population is vaccinated? How um, deadly is the disease? How um, quickly do people recover? And then uh, the focus is on disease within networks of um, social interaction. A lot more scientific research is now focused in areas such as uh, the look at social networks to see how the interaction of individuals has impact on, uh, on, on health and well-being of individuals. And um, this uses uh, some Python tools, including a network uh, analysis tool called Network X. And uh, as we run all the code in the notebook, What we end up with is a interactive widget that allows us to explore uh, how that disease affects the population over time based on the parameters of the model and based on the interaction of the network. So uh, you see here, uh, without, without going into too much detail, that um, there's 50 people in this network uh, under consideration. They have, um, each of them, 10 connections. What we can do is potentially, if we're in the process of exploring this model and evaluating it, let's say we increase the size of that network to 500. And uh, then we, each one of those people, let's say, we say they have 20 connections. We can go back at this point in the code, rerun those cells, and what we're gonna do is have that widget reproduced with the new parameters attached to that model. So you see we have a lot more nodes in that network and we can then look at how that process um, plays out in a wider social network. Let's go back to the presentation. Okay. As far as how we can integrate tools like uh, um, Jupyter and languages like Python and R with, uh, with Drupal, um, we can simply link content um, pieces to each other. Um, we can, as we saw, um, bring in content and data from Drupal as a service. Uh, we can, as we saw, uh, convert the notebook to PDF or HTML and attach it or import it in the Drupal. Um, a lot of folks are using the iframe to display, display um, um, notebooks within Drupal. This is an example of a notebook that um, is part of a blog that's maintained by a researcher on the Open Scholar Drupal distribution platform that's used as many, in many universities. Uh, the notebook is part of a, a broad ecosystem, as we saw, it includes GitHub. Uh, notebooks are uh, posted to GitHub are rendered dynamically, automatically, with a few limitations. There is, uh, and, and we saw that uh, uh, Docker, uh, uh, it plays a big role in the Jupyter ecosystem. A lot of uh, researchers are now distributing, along with their research studies, um, notebooks either in the notebook format or embedded in Docker containers. Uh, Jupyter has become a, um, has a, now a big role as a data science IE platform um, uh, in, 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 in all the, the major cloud pr um, service systems, Amazon, IBM, and, and Microsoft Azure. There's a uh, data science social network called Kaggle. Uh, notebook is a central part of that. 
It's being used in executable books, uh, in uh, journalism. Uh, this is a notebook that was distributed by a media firm in the United States, uh, along with a news story analyzing the um, Twitter behavior of a US public official. I won't uh, name that person, but if they were presenting here, the talk would likely be titled, Making Drupal Great Again. Um, there is, um, it's being widely, the notebook is being widely used in academia, in e-learning. Uh, the, the examples we uh, looked at uh, used the Python programming language um, as, 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 a, as a programmatic um, interface to, in the notebook. Um, Python uh, is quickly emerging as one of the leading um, Languages in data science, because it's relatively easy to learn. A lot of scientists have a, who aren't programmers by profession have adopted Python. And there's been a lot of um, um, package is in the area of data science developed in Python. It's got an excellent package management tool. Uh, it's relatively easy to read. And there are even vibrant sub-communities uh, within science built that are have uh, um, developed among Python, the um, image, the neuroimaging um, notebook we looked at included some very specific Python packages, just focusing on very aspects of neuroscience. Another language that's popular in data science uh, that can be used in a notebook uh, that's relatively easy to adopt to and has is Azar, which was developed specifically for um, data science. Um, it also had, it was born out of the world of statistics. So there are a lot of packages, a lot of uh, scientific um, and, and statistical related packages developed around R. Um, is possible um, within a notebook even either to run a notebook um, on a specific language or you can actually mix different languages within a single notebook using what a uh, uh, concept of the, what is known as cell magics. The um, person who's given credit for creating the Jupyter Notebook, a uh, gentleman named Fernando Perez, sees it as a tool for accelerating the pace of scientific research. Uh, historically, it's taken a long time when someone has a new idea to get that actually published in a journal article. There's a long, labor uh, laborious process in place uh, for uh, taking a, a scientific idea, writing it in a journal article, submitting it and getting re reviewed. The notebook, uh, as part of a open agile content publishing workflow, potentially uh, would accelerate, help accelerate that process. And you can envision a situation where you have a notebook that's developed by a researcher in a lab or by an investigative reporter it's pushed into a data or code repository, um, so it becomes immediately available for um, evaluation, for collaboration, and eventually it's published alongside a note notebook um, in, in an open access journal. This new model also uh, leads us to consider then, with the rise of data science and the popularity of the Jupyter Notebook, if there may be, may be a new model emerging for scientific content and content in general in a data-centric world. And the idea here is that high quality, um, complete content in the future may not only represent the text and the, and the graphics and the references to the data uh, and the methods that were used to produce that text, but also the whole computational environment that we use to create it becomes part of the core content itself. Uh, this is a concept that's only beginning to emerge. So it's gonna be very exciting um, to see where this develops in the coming years and um, very interesting to see how we in the Drupal community can use this productively alongside Drupal itself. 
So with that, I'd like to thank you for hanging around so late and attending and uh, invite you to complete the evaluation on this session. Thank you very much.